Now I'm going to tell you about a different program. Uh, this program is called Software Defined Hardware, or SDH. And the goal in this program is a little different than the Hive program. Our goal here is to build hardware and software that allows us to achieve near ASIC performance on a variety of data analytic and machine learning algorithms uh, without having to pay the design cost repeatedly for ASICs. Um, and the premise here is that ASICs are really, really painful to build. They're really expensive to construct. And when we construct them, we essentially commit to designs uh, that are optimized for single algorithms or single classes of algorithms that are similar to each other. And almost always, that commitment means that we're making suboptimal choices architecturally for a wide range of workloads that we would like to actually be able to execute. So many of us have been spoiled by Moore's Law. We've had this opportunity to implement code, algorithms, uh, on general purpose processors and had the ability to wait around for those processors to get faster and achieve all of this excellent performance without having to actually pay the design cost. But we all know that Moore's Law is ending. You've been hearing about this for the last two summits. And the practical reality is that we have to pay some amount of design cost in order to get good performance. But the premise behind this program is maybe we don't have to do that entirely. Maybe we can defer some of our design decisions to later and then optimize those, uh, the configuration of hardware and software so that we can achieve near ASIC performance uh, without having to design specifically for a given algorithm. So how do we do this? We do this by building very, very fast reconfigurable processors. These are processors that are so fast in terms of re reconfiguration that they can reconfigure, they can reconfigure as programs are actually executing. We're talking about reconfiguration times on the order of a microsecond. And if you can think about doing microsecond level reconfiguration and continuous compilation of software and configuration of that hardware simultaneously, you can start to think about doing optimizations that are specific not only to the algorithm that you're computing, but to the data that you're actually computing on. And that's the premise behind the SDH program. What we're building is essentially hardware and software that is entirely malleable, that chooses the particular implementation of an algorithm depending on the data that it's observing and the algorithm that's being computed. Uh, to optimize everything up and down the stack always. So uh, to make this happen requires a whole bunch of things to actually uh, occur, a whole bunch of technological breakthroughs to actually occur. One of the key technological breakthroughs that we're working on in this program is the ability to decide dynamically where to do computation. So you heard from Steve that one of the key concepts behind our current architectures is that we do computation in processors. But actually, that's not the only option for us. We can do computation near memory as well. And making the decision about where to do that kind of computation and where computational elements can sit is one of the key advantages of a program like SDH. Um, SDH has built ways through the work at Princeton and, and the University of Washington uh, to do both near and in-memory computation and to automatically make decisions about where the software actually runs uh, and what the software actually targets depending on the data in the program that's actually being executed. And this results in both speed improvements and power reduction uh, in, in, on the order of an order of magnitude. Now, the kind of reconfiguration that I talked to you about in the last slide on the order of a microsecond for a full system is the kind of reconfiguration that we can't do today because our systems are, one, fundamentally not designed to allow for that because of the fine-grained reconfiguration that is typically required for systems like FPGAs. But the other issue is that the communication infrastructure within a chip is typically way too slow and way too expensive to reconfigure. And so the folks at Michigan have been working on faster interconnection that is very, very energy efficient. 
these are crossbars that cost somewhere in the order of 100 femtojoules to reconfigure. They can reconfigure in a single nanosecond. That's essentially one compute instruction. And what that allows for is reconfiguration while data is in flight. So if you can think about processing data, executing an instruction, what you can do now is execute an instruction and then change the routing of where the outputs of that instruction go while the actual computation is happening. This allows for redesign of various algorithms that are typically data dependent in the routing of their data. In other words, the computational result or the computational intermediary tells us where the next, uh, the next processing element should be. And that allows for algorithm specific re, uh, reconfiguration at all times. Now lastly, uh, one of the things that we do not want to do in this program is to incur huge uh, programmability burden on, on programmers that are trying to make use of specialization. So one of, the, one of the hallmarks of specialization is that it sucks for programmers. Right? Programmers are stuck with the elements that they have, and they have to write specific code for the limited computational capabilities that they have access to in, in a specialized processor. Uh, and they have to do all sorts of optimizations for that specialization in order to actually make it work well. So um, I'm not going to talk about this part in too much detail because my colleague Saman Amar Singh is going to talk more in more detail about the work that they're doing to build a system called TACO. But TACO is essentially a system that allows people who are programming machine learning algorithms, especially tensor-based machine learning algorithms, to express their programs essentially as math and for that math to be translated into highly optimized code depending on both the data that's being processed and also the, the underlying architecture that the data is being processed on. And what they have found is that they can generate code smartly in automated ways that is very close to hand optimized code and oftentimes better than what, uh, what we would call code ninjas can do. Um, by using smart techniques on the, on the generation side and profiling of, of the data and recompilation methods that Saman will talk to you about in more detail. Now, these are just three highlights of our program. Our program has a number of teams that are working on it, uh, and I'm not going to get into all of the details of all of the efforts going on, but there are various approaches to the hardware, various approaches to the software, these are the folks that are involved in our effort. Feel free to reach out to any of them. They're mostly here in the audience, and, and you can talk to them directly. Um, but without further ado, what I think I will do is hand this over to Saman so that he can tell you more about how software can be optimized and take programmers out of the loop for program optimization in these specialized processors. Thank you, Red. Good morning. My name is Saman Namarasinghe. I'm going to talk to you about domain-specific language for domain-specific architectures. We are at the end of Moore's Law and Dennett Scaling, and there's a lot of anxiety out there what to do next. And I'm here to tell you that there's a lot of opportunity left, especially if you're looking at the software stack. In fact, last year when uh, Hennessy and Patterson won the Turing Award, they looked at what's in the future, and they found a lot of uh, possible opportunities. There's a lot of software opportunities as well as hardware opportunities for them to work on. And what they found was domain-specific architectures to be one of the biggest opportunities to basically keep this uh, growth in compute power going. And for them, when domain-specific architecture, they were not looking at architectures that do single computation like MPEG encoder, but something like a GPU or, or TPU that basically trying to accelerate the entire domain. And they came up with a lot of reasons why you can get good performance, because each of these domains has specific properties of parallelism, memory access, even the data size and data uh, computation. And these can give you really good uh, uh, performance if you take advantage of that. But beyond that, they looked at domain-specific languages. They thought, to make these domain-specific architectures work, you need domain-specific languages, and domain-specific languages can give you much higher, easier use for these complicated domain-specific architectures. And in their look, that's what they thought that the community should be working to, uh, in, in the near future. So what's a domain-specific language? 
A domain-specific language is something that you can capture the expert's knowledge directly for a specific targeted domain. This is really nice for domain-specific language, uh, the experts, because you can program in the level you think about your problem. You don't have to go and try to understand uh, uh, lower level loops and arrays and let You can actually think and program at the level you think about your problem. That makes it easy to program. But it gives you much better advantage for compiler designers. So let me talk about a couple of those advantages. So for example, each domain has some very specific things you can do to the program, some transformations. And if I'm writing a domain-specific compiler, I can embed those transformations in the compiler so the programmer don't have to deal with that. Second, as a compiler writer, I have spent sometimes 90% of my time trying to undo the optimizations the, uh, uh, the programmers think they do that's good for the program because they do things this low level, so we had to heroic analysis to basically to understand the intent of the programmer. What does the programmer trying to do? So I can actually try to optimize that code. So we go through this low level programming language like C and Java and then try to undo to the higher level and then go back to optimize these things. So given the programmer programs at that high level, I don't have to do that undo. I get the programmer intent much easier. And what that means is I can actually go and try to generate fast code to multiple architectures much easier in this one. So what I'm going to do is I'm going to talk about two different domain-specific uh, uh, languages and how they impacted the architecture. The first language I'm going to talk about is Halite. Halite originated from our group at uh, MIT. And today, it has become an industry standard for image processing. So if you want to go to image processing, if you want to do a simple blur, you can write this piece of code. This is probably what you write in a class. This works. Expect, except if you want to get really good performance, you have to write this piece of code. This piece basically has tiled, fused, vectorized, multi-threaded. It's getting the near roofline performance. It's 11x faster. But for even that simple piece that you have to write this piece of code, it's not that easy. So what Halite tried to do was separate this idea. So most of the signal processing, image processing algorithms are simple. It's all about optimization. Why don't you specify the algorithm in the simplest form? And for example, you can write blur using these two lines of code. This example it, it, uh, describes what you want to compute. However, it doesn't tell you how to compute, how to get really good performance. And instead of trying to do that automatically, what Halite did was it introduced another concept called a scheduling language that can tell you, take that program, that algorithm at high level, and here's how to map uh, that into the architecture, with basically where and when to compute and how to move and keep data is specified using the scheduling language. So by doing that, you can get the ninja programmer's performance but much easier, you don't write this very complicated code, and if you write the algorithm once and make sure the algorithm works, now I can go from architecture to architecture, different optimization, and get correct code without having to debug the algorithm for every, every case. So today, Halite has been used in industry. So for example, Adobe Photoshop, the current version is written using Halite filter uh, uh, for ima uh, image processing. It's in Google uh, Android phones. All the uh, uh, data coming in through YouTube is uh, ingested through Halite pipeline. So it's accepted in the image processing community in, in industry. However, something very interesting has happened. When Qualcomm developed their uh, 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 image signal processor, and Google developed this uh, uh, Pixel Visual Core. These are very complicated processors. In order to make them usable, what they have done is they have used Halite as the programming language for these specialized uh, hardware. So by making Halite the programming language, they get some very interesting advantages. So you can write the algorithms in a very high level and use the scheduling language to map those algorithms in this very complicated hardware. And by doing that, what they have made is it's possible to get this hardware to a much wider use. And if you 
play with the scheduler, you can get really good performance in there. So you can get ninja class performance for a much larger class of uh, uh, programs without too much effort into this one. So this is what we want to achieve. Basically, come up with these domain-specific languages, and you can specify the, the problems at higher level, and then map it into these specialized domain-specific architectures. So next, I'm going to talk about a problem we are working on in uh, uh, a software-defined hardware project uh, with Wade, which is the TACO uh, compiler for sparse tense algebra. So if you look at tensors, they are everywhere. What's the sensor? It is basically a multidimensional matrix, or if you can think about it as a big spreadsheet, but it's multidimensional. So tensors are complete in everywhere in today. If you look at data analytics, if you want to figure out a movie recommendation, the movie data can be represented as a tensor. Or social networks, a lot of graph data is rep can represent as a tensor, multidimensional data. They are in machine learning. A lot of machine learning data and machine learning algorithms can be described as tensor computation. In fact, these two are pretty new. If you go back 30 years, Many engineering problems, things like simulations, can be viewed as tensors. So the simple tensors are these dense multidimensional data structures, but something very specific and important is the sparse tensors. So let's look at Amazon product reviews. So if you look at Amazon product reviews, for every product Amazon has, for every customer who purchased something from Amazon, and every word they have used to write a review, gives you a 3D, three-dimensional tensor. So if you want to represent this as a dense tensor, there's a lot of zeros, but if you want to represent this, you can't do that because the entire Amazon data center won't have enough storage to represent this tensor. However, if you throw away all the zeros, and if you don't represent the zeros, and if you only represent non-zero values, it'll, the data set will fit in my lap, uh, laptop or desktop. So that's what we want to do. However, representing these sparse data structures can be complicated because that, it's not a very simple uh, uh, array. It's a much more complicated data structures. So let me show you a little bit of complexity here. So if you look at something like uh, uh, this is a three tensor vector multiplication. If all the data is dense, this is a code a freshman computer science students can write, very simple. But now, instead of uh, this uh, B tensor being uh, uh, dense, I use this using a complex uh, sparse uh, fiber format. It's a, 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 a basically a, a compressed sparse fiber is a sparse format. You have to write a little bit more complicated code. Now, I basically make the uh, vector also compressed. Now the code gets a little bit more complicated because now I had to deal with two different compressed data structures co-iterated through. And in fact, if I change the vector into a different compressed format, some very different piece of code has to be written, still large and complicated. So if this is hard, think about I'm adding two different three tensors basically in here. To get the best performance, I need to have this code uh, uh, generated or written. So this is why this is really, really hard, because the code you have to write to iterate through these complicated data structures is not that simple. So one way to look at that is how to do this today. Today, all these tensor computations you need is written by hand in libraries. So things like linear algebra uh, uh, um, functions, uh, data analytics, and even in physics, quantum corner dynamics, there are many different uh, tensor expressions that today library writers hand write these. So let's look at the simplest uh, computation here. This is a sparse matrix vector. And one of the uh, most heavily used libraries is a library called Eigen. So they have implemented it, obviously, this is very important. However, if you look at other libraries like CSPAS and OSCE, they have implemented many small variants of uh, sparse matrix vector multiply because these variants, if you write a specialized piece of code, you can get higher performance. They do that. In fact, if you look at OSCE, they have a 282 versions of just sparse matrix vector multiplication. Why? Because these sparse matrices and vectors can come in many different formats. So there are 
lot of formats are here, some. So for example, compressed pass row is good for thermal simulation. Doubly compressed pass row is good for web matrices. Uh, uh, finite element analysis uses block matrices inside blocks in here. So these formats go on and on because different data has different shapes and some formats will do very well in those shapes. So in order to get good performance, you need to represent those formats. So the formats list is large. And now we have to write code for each of these with each format, but obviously we run it in different architectures. So this combinatorial explosion is very, very large. So this is why libraries is very difficult to basically use libraries to base, uh, support uh, uh, these te uh, sparse tensors. Another way, method that people have used is instead of writing very complicated functions, why don't you fight sign uh, the binary functions? So you take uh, two operand functions and you divide them and you can combine them to build bigger things. So here's a function used in machine learning called sparse dense dense matrix multiplication. So it basically multiplies two uh, dense matrices. So in order to do that, we can use uh, very fast dense matrix multiplication routines. We have generated them well. But then what you're doing is you're element-wise multiplying this as a sparse matrix. To get this value, I need to calculate this dense matrix, very easy. Uh, I get the value. But in order to calculate this value, I don't have to do anything. So what you do is you this, do this multiplication of this dense matrices, I get 64 elements, and I'm throwing out 54 elements, and you only need 10. So this is asymptotically bad if you do this multiplication as uh, two different uh, uh, units in here. So in fact, that's uh, uh, shown in results. So Taco, the compiler we wrote, can generate this code. Uh, to the entire expression, and we get pretty good results. Eigen, this Eigen library, in fact, knew this is a very important expression, so they wrote a specialized code that does that. On the other hand, Ublast said, hey, I have separate operations for matrix-matrix multiplication and element-wise matrix multiplication. Why can't I combine them together? You do that, you get asymptotically bad result in here. Another expression called MTTKRP used in data analytics, again, the same thing. You have a complex expression in here, and basically uh, uh, Splat, the library that is focused on these uh, uh, tensor factorizations, have a very specialized piece of code to do MTTKRP. We generate that, and Tensor Toolbox, another library, basically try to build it out of components, and they get asymptotically bad behavior. Again, something very simple like uh, sparse matrix multiplication. There are many libraries out there that implement this because this is a workhorse of sparse computation. Uh, if you look at MKL, Intel MKL is a, one of the best libraries out there today for uh, uh, tense operations. And their performance is very close to what Taco can generate. Other libraries don't do a good job in parallelization. So we are much better and close to best performance out there today. So this is what we can do by auto-generation. So why this is important is today, the software, we have achieved very complicated software by abstraction. So here's an abstraction that I showed uh, using two different functions to build a much more complicated uh, function in here. But there's a cost for this abstraction. First cost is every time you create a, a, a call a function, it creates the entire output. And you have to uh, materialize this output. And then when you go to the next function, that output might be completely out of the cache because we created this very large data. And then you try to process it, and you don't have cache optimization. In sparsity, there's even a bigger cost because I might be creating throwaway work that the other one basically just basically multiply by 0 and, and get rid of. And I don't want to compute that. So what's my alternative? My alternative is to generate something a lot more complicated, this like hand-optimized piece of code out there. This is spaghetti code, and you don't want to write this by hand. So our option is basically come up with a uh, domain-specific language that has all the nice abstraction, but the compiler can generate this piece of code. So that is how I can hide the abstraction in here. So for that, we have built this tense algebra compiler called Taco. Taco can take any expression and any format uh, for each of these tensors, and we can generate code for uh, uh, CPUs, GPUs, we can uh, for gen distributed machines, and right now we are also looking at generating code for this NVIDIA Symfony architecture that we are developing in this program. So let me tell you a little bit technical why this is hard. So assume I'm just going to multiply two different sparse vectors. 
And this is multiplication means I need to intersect when there's a value in B or C. So what that means is I don't want to do anything if it's only value in B or only value for that index in C. I only need to calculate the values if there's an intersection in here. So this is what I have to generate. However, if we're doing addition, I had to do a, a, a union, and union becomes a little bit more complicated because now, if there's value in both B and C, I had to do the addition. Otherwise, I just have to copy the value from B and value from C. I don't want to do add by zero. So now I had generated a little bit more complicated piece of code. And then if the expression get more complicated, like adding three things, so the combinatorics now get a lot more complicated. I had to generate code for each of these cases. I only had to add B, C, and D only in that middle small part that does union of uh, intersection of all three. Others I do less and less computation. I have generated this code. And even little different complication things, I need to generate a, a different piece of code. So I can generate this optimal code basically uh, by analyzing this. So this is what the Taco compiler can do today. So there's been a lot of work trying to make these things go fast. So TPUs, MIT IRIS, and Stanford uh, um, has developed this hardware to do this. But this hardware is basically single purpose. They can do matrix, matrix, multiply, or sparse matrix, matrix, multiply. So what we are trying to do is build a piece of hardware that can support any tensor, sparse tensor operation in here. So this is the uh, NVIDIA Symphony architecture we are generating. To give you a small glimpse in here, what had happened is we are building specific hardware in, in, in here to do this merge operation. The merge operation is doing union and intersection very fast, so we are not going to fetch data or process data that doesn't participate in the computation. And we can do that, and we can get really good performance uh, uh, by doing that. And so what happens is, uh, by doing this, what we can do is we can take the entire program that can be very complicated and look at the specific things that we can map to hardware and accelerate. By doing that, we can basically generate a code for any tensor, sparse tensor operation, and we get the hardware to accelerate when it's possible. So let's step back a little bit and see what are the issues if we want to have a lot of different DSLs. So one issue is, Every domain, now we are going to generate a DSL, and we had to optimize for this DSL. So there's work to be done. One is building a DSL is not that simple. It's harder than building libraries. So we want to have tools to do that. For example, Stanford has this project called Delight that helps build in DSLs. We are also building a tool basically to get any DSL to complicated hardware backend, something like LLVM did for uniprocessor. We want to do it for multiple hardware classes. So this makes it uh, interesting to me and easier to build DSLs. Another part is you want to interoperate between DSL because most problems won't fit into one DSL. Something like multi-physics might be combining problems from multiple DSLs. So how do you do that is an interesting problem. So for example, you want to have something like a, a, a simple interface, something like Python glue with uh, C data structures that these multiple DSLs can talk so you don't have to do complicated and expensive data transformations to go from one DSL to another. Another part, these days, programmers have accepted that we can uh, come up and use new languages. There's a purification of new languages, but that means we need to give good support for those languages. Just building the language and compile is not sufficient. You need to build debuggers, package managers, all those things in here. I want to switch gears a little bit and say why we are very excited that we can build more DSLs because during Moore's law, I think we left a lot of performance in the ground. We built very sloppy software, and there's a lot to gain in that. So let me give you one very simple example. If you look at matrix multiply, dense matrix multiply, you can write a very simple four-line code in Python, and you get a certain level of performance. But if you just move it to Java, you get an 11x speed up. If you move it to C, you get a 47x speed up on top of that. If you parallelize, you get a 300x speed up. And if you start doing some optimization of this code, you can end up about 62x, 1000x speed up using the same piece of code and optimize. In any other engineering domain, if you do something like this, you'll get fired. And probably it might be considered criminal. But in software, we are very happy to write these very high-level program, uh, level programs and basically leave a lot of performance on the ground. So I think we have a good opportunity to take advantage of that in the future, and many different DSLs do that. 
To in conclusion, I think domain-specific architectures are our future, and domain-specific languages are essential to make these domain-specific architectures usable and get good performance. And in our project, uh, we are looking at multiple different domain specific uh, domains to build domain specific languages and i'm very interested in find other domains that we can build domain specific languages thank you